This interview is for information only and should not be considered as investment advice or a recommendation to buy shares in the company featured. Welcome to this stock box interview. Well, joining us today is Andrew Broadkey, the Chief Operating Officer of Idaho Copper, listed on the OTC, currently with the ticker GTVI, soon to become as part of a reverse takeover, IDCU. Well, thank you very much for joining me today. Andrew, how are you doing? I am great, Mark. How are you? It's your afternoon in the UK, I take it. Indeed, it is my afternoon, your morning, but we can make the times work. So thank you for joining us. Could you perhaps start us off by giving us a high-level overview of the company, the situation with the reverse takeover, and then we can talk a bit more about the project. I will do that, Mark, and thanks again for having me on today. Uh, the company is called Idaho Copper. We actually completed the reverse takeover of a shell on the US OTC pink sheets several months ago. And actually, this is the first opportunity that we've had to uh, tell the world about Idaho Copper, first time we've been a public company. Uh, again, that merger was done back uh, in sometime in February, and it was the culmination of a lot of, uh, if you will, dissociation from our former parent company, which is a Canadian company traded on the TSXV. But now we're an independent company. We are trading. Uh, we are moving ahead. We have a lot of plans this year. The project is fabulous. It's massive. It's a project that contains today just the measured and indicated categories about, uh, call it, Four billion pounds of copper, a billion and a half pounds of molybdenum, and about 300 million ounces of silver. That's just in the MI. The inferred is about double that, but we expect this project's going to grow. Today, we've got in copper equivalent, uh, using some fairly modest uh, conversion numbers, we've got about uh, 12 billion pounds of copper equivalent. Okay, 12 billion pounds of copper equivalent. Before we talk about that, because that sounds very significant and exciting indeed, just to be clear, this is a company is a spin out from an existing TSX company that is now getting its listing on the OTC. Is, is that right? Correct. Okay, perfect. Well, let's talk about the project then. So the project, uh, what is it called? What's the name? It's Kumo Copper Molybdenum Project, isn't it? Yeah, it's a copper molybdenum silver project. Uh, it's one of the largest undeveloped copper projects in the Americas, and probably the largest undeveloped molybdenum, primary molybdenum project in the world. And we're really excited about the project. It is advanced. We've had a number of drilling campaigns. The last one culminated uh, about a decade ago. Uh, we have more drilling to do, of course, but we've had an iteration of different PEAs. The last PEA, was published in 2020, it was uh, authored by SRK and a number of individual QPs, uh, but it came to the conclusion that, uh, I told you about the resources, uh, the resources are huge. We have multi-billion uh, tons of ore in this project. It's just massive. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the location. We're in the state of Idaho in the USA. Idaho rated by the Fraser Institute, which a lot of people in the mining industry are pretty familiar with. Idaho is one of the top 10 jurisdictions in the world for mining. We are on federal land. We're in the Boise National Forest. We're about 35 miles north of the city of Boise, which is the capital of uh, the state, uh, a city of about 800,000 people, maybe a million in the metropolitan area. There's a workforce nearby. We've got all the infrastructure we need. We've got water nearby. Uh, we've got power nearby. We also have, as I mentioned, the workforce and road access is fantastic. So uh, other than the snow sometimes in the winter, it's a, a full year round access to get to the mine site. Okay, so this project has all those three credits, copper, molybdenum and silver. And just remind us, you have a billion pounds of copper. How much molly, how much silver? No, we've got uh, today in the M&I category, we've got about four billion pounds of copper. We've four got billion three, pounds of copper. Yeah. 300 million ounces of silver and a, and a 1.5 billion pounds of molly. Right. And what, what, what grades are you seeing on, on the copper side of things? Well, uh, this, is where the, uh, this is where it gets a little interesting, and let me explain. Our in-situ grades aren't very high, and that's because what we have here is a porphyry system that is, generally speaking, a stockwork vein system. They're thin veins going through uh, the whole ore body. We have three zones, by the way. We have at the upper zone, we have a copper 
silver zone, then it transitions into a copper moly zone, and then the core is more of a straight molybdenum zone. So I mentioned the grades are not high in situ, but because it's a stock work, because you can easily separate the vein material that carries 90% of the actual metals from the waste, this is one of the projects that lends itself absolutely to ore sorting. We've done a number of testing work to begin with. In the 2020 PEA, SRK applied, uh, based on some particle sorting, which is kind of tertiary sorting, they applied a 28% uh, factor to reduce waste. We know from visual sorting, we can actually probably ideally at, at the outset uh, do a heck of a lot better than that, probably in the range of 75 to 80% waste reduction. We've, uh, we're have in the process today of uh, contracting with MindSense in Vancouver, who have a very good ore sorting technology. We're actually scanning first to uh, check against the actual assays, and then we're sending material up, material up to Vancouver where the MindSense labs are. All this means, getting back to the original question, Mark, that the in-situ grades of this project are deceiving and not, not realistically something that we are looking at. We're looking at the head grade to the mill. SRK said, based on the only ability to take out 28% of the waste, we needed to build 150,000 ton a day mill. The capex associated with that and all the infrastructure was over $3 billion. When I got involved with the project, we knew that we had to do a lot better than that. So we're looking at a mill after ore sorting and getting the head grades up to call it over 1% copper, um, and actually closer to 1.5% copper going to the mill, we can build a 30,000 ton a day mill rather than 150. And the CapEx comes down from 3 billion to less than a billion dollars. And that's without optimizing everything. But that's what our PEA update later this year should be able to show. Okay. You mentioned at the start there that this, uh, this 4 billion is actually is measured and indicated. So it's past the initial inferred stage. Is copper going to be the priority for this project and, and the molly and the silver are additional sort of bonus credits, or are you going to be going after that just as strong? It all comes out in, in, in the wash, it comes out as you put things through the concentrator. We'll have a molly circuit uh, and we'll have a copper circuit. Uh, okay. The, yeah, and the molly, the, the molly circuit will, uh, it's important because there's a shortage of molybdenum in the world as well. Molybdenum is one of the elements as well as copper that's needed for the energy transition that we're going through worldwide and the net zero carbon emission goal. Uh, everything we're going for, Mark, is absolutely uh, something that we need. And it, again, it's a domestic source for US, uh, US uh, consumers of copper, molybdenum and, and silver for that matter. Okay. But you mentioned there about the PEA. That is, of course, an objective that you want to achieve this year. So, I mean, how much work has been done for this PEA so far? When do you hope to get it fully completed? The interesting part is that it's almost all done on the resource side. We're not doing any additional drilling. We're relying on the resources that have been verified and confirmed uh, over the last uh, you know, 15 years that this project has been uh, explored. What we're really doing is going. we're going to bring in uh, to play the work on the ore sorting side. As I mentioned, MindSense, uh, later this year, we'll be getting our samples. They'll be able to tell us based on a different technology they have called shovel sense, which actually can measure and uh, give you some indications of grade and differentiations between ore and waste at the face itself. We're also going to be looking at some different blasting patterns rather than uh, large uh, large long hole. We're looking at shorter and closer spaced holding holes so we can uh, differentiate between w waste and ore at the face itself. So everything's going to be geared towards getting waste out of the system as early as possible. And when I mentioned uh, the bucket sense uh, sorting or shovel sense that my sense deploys, that'll just be our first uh, pass at sorting. We expect that we'll be probably using conveyors out of this pit and looking at some sort of uh, intensive sorting that actually permeates the material as it goes down uh, the conveyor belt. So it'll be either a PGNA or PFTNA type uh, sorting mechanism that further allows you, in our judgment, to be able to differentiate between high grade, low grade, and other material. High grade going directly to the mill, and then stockpiling the other grades uh, as things progress. And possibly at the end, we might have a tertiary type of sorting that's already been looked at, which is particle sorting. But the idea is to reduce the volume of material that's going through the system to reach passive sorting and push as much 
to waste as early as you can in the whole process. So this will all start to become obvious or more clear during the PEA. When did you say you wanted to get it completed by? We expect and hope to publish it before the end of the year and with a little luck, maybe by the beginning of the winter. By the way, okay. this type of sorting is something that is widely used in the industry. Uh, Tech uses it at Highland Valley, Copper Mountain uses it at uh, their project. Those are both in BC. Uh, we've cataloged over 100 uh, different mines throughout the world that use some form of bore sorting today. So this is proven mm -hmm. technology. It's not like we're inventing something new. No, absolutely. Uh, that's used quite uh, quite a lot these days. It's very, uh, very useful technology, certainly to get ore going before it goes towards the mill. So when this PA, PEA comes out, we'll obviously get a much better idea of how the mine will shape, a little bit of an idea of the capital cost. But can you give a bit of an idea of what you think it might be? Is it going to be open pit blasting? And do you have any idea of the capital cost or how you might secure funding in order to get uh, it, it actually built into production, which I guess is what you're going for in the not too distant future? Well, we need to recognize we're a small company and we're trading on the OTC. I will say that we have big plans. Uh, I don't know how far we'll get down the road, but I, let me tell you what where we're going. Uh, in about a year from now, we can uplist to a bigger and a better exchange in the States, uh, either the, uh, the NYSE Amex or the NASDAQ. And on those exchanges, it's much easier to raise capital. So today, you know, we're just doing nothing more than trying to get enough uh, cash in to be able to complete our PEA before the end of the okay. year. We figure that's about uh, 700 plus or minus thousand dollars US. Uh, ultimately, uh, we expect that we'll go to the PFS that I mentioned. That'll probably be about a year and a half in terms of duration. And uh, we've estimated, and it's pretty rough now, but 25 to 30 million dollars US to get to that stage. Now, if I had my druthers and we could go all the way and actually go to uh, a bankable feasibility study and obtain project financing and do this ourselves, that'd be fantastic. But, you know, you need to be a realist in this business. At the point where we probably have a PFS, I think we're going to be very attractive to a much larger company. And I'm not saying we wouldn't want to stay involved, but we'll look at the options then. I mean, this would be a perfect opportunity for this company to become part of a larger company, or we could bring in some partners. There's a lot of different ways we could go. But I think that most of uh, the contacts we've had, and we've talked to a lot of different industry players. We've talked to, uh, we talked to uh, big uh, people in the industry that are uh, larger companies. We've talked to PE funds that are in the industry. We've talked to uh, funds that provide uh, streaming and royalty type capital. And I think people are just waiting for us to advance this on our own so they can get a better idea of what this looks like. Well, I'm sure you will get to that point, getting a better idea of what it looks like. You do have advanced plans there, ambitious plans to take it maybe all the way to bankable feasibility study, whether you'll get it into production yourself or whether you're attractive to uh, another party remains to be seen. We can keep an eye out for that PEA this year. That's a big uh, milestone for the company to achieve. Any other activities you'll be working on, working up towards that PEA that the market can watch out for? Not really, Mark, because that, that's the big milestone that we've got to accomplish this year. The only thing that's changing is uh, the ore sorting. And of course, we have to update, update the economics. Costs have changed since 2020. Metal prices have changed since 2020. So in our updated PEA, applying ore sorting, I think you're going to see uh, the results, at least I, I'm hoping that what you're going to see are huge reductions in the capital because our mill is going to be incredibly much smaller. And you're also going to see much improved economics for the reasons that I've, that I've just mentioned. And so the sensitivity should look good on this project when our PEA comes out. In the meantime, we're going through, we're finishing some permitting so that we can hopefully drill in 2024. Uh, there's a lot of infill drilling we still need to do. Uh, there's some expansion drilling on uh, several parts of the ore body that are open. And there's some geotechnical uh, drilling we need to do in some of the pit walls, but that'll come as soon as we receive our final approval from the U.S. Forest Service. So that's for 2024. Okay, so that'll help to just prove up more of the resource, get it more into the more measured, indicated category. Exactly. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time today, Andrew Broadkey, the Chief Operating Officer of Idaho Copper. Mark, thank you so much. And again, we really appreciate the opportunity. This is the first chance we've had to really go to the market and let them know what this project's about. So we're very, very grateful to you. Thank you. Excellent. Well, I look forward to following the story and hopefully we can catch up again in the not too distant future. Take care. Thanks.
If you enjoyed this interview, then give us a thumbs up, a like or a retweet. Subscribe to us on YouTube or follow us on Twitter and hit that notification bell to be the first to know when we release new content. There's loads of great content on our website too, across all our programs at stockboxmedia.com. Thank you for watching.